I can introduce myself. Right. Yeah, I, I don't think I'll even stand up. Is there a point to standing? Yes, sir. Just the board. All right. Well, I'm not going to use the board. So yeah, I'm Ryan O'Donnell. OK, so for these experts in the audience, I'm going to tell some white lies to these two folks. And uh, you can spend your time trying to catch them instead of catching me on them. Um, OK, so suppose like God came down to you and said, I'll answer one yes or no question about math for you. What would you ask, Eve? You give up, Melissa? Uh, no curiosity at all? Yes and no, actually. Yeah, that's the thing. Anybody? <laughs> that's about a mathematics, right? <laughs> all right, so one thing you could ask is, like, you could ask, uh, you know, is the Riemann hypothesis true? But that's a huge blunder, if you ask me, because imagine how the conversation would go. You'd say, you know, is the Riemann hypothesis true? And God would say, yep. And then, you know, like you gain no useful information, right? Like everybody knows that it's true. So that's not an interesting question. So if it were up to me, I'd ask something about, you know, my area, theoretical computer science. So I guess I would ask if factoring has an efficient algorithm. But if I got two questions, my second question would be whether or not uh, the unique games conjecture is true, which is the subject of this little talk, the unique games conjecture. And uh, I guess the point of this anecdote is, you know, uh, or this, this hypothetical is that uh, I find it interesting because it's like a 50-50 proposition. Like half the people who work on it think it's true and half the people think it's false. So like if you ask you know, God whether it's true or not, you would like actually gain a lot of information by getting the yes or no answer. Uh, so that's what makes it interesting to me. Uh, OK, so just to remind you two guys, I don't know how much you know about computational complexity, but the gist of it is like you're interested in like tasks that you might want to solve with like a computer. And uh, for each task, you want to decide if there's like an efficient algorithm for it or there's no such efficient algorithm for it. And all these terms have like proper definitions, but I'll just skip them. Uh, I just want to make the, the uh, distinction known between like a, a problem and like an instance of a problem. So like a problem, an example of a problem is like multiplication of two numbers. So that's the problem. And then the instance is like two actual numbers that you have to multiply together. You should imagine they have like, you know, like 1,000 digits if you're trying to do it by hand or like a billion digits if you're trying to do it on your computer. So like multiplication as a problem is an easy problem because you know you all guys know how to multiply and it's a pretty efficient process and your computer can easily multiply two billion digit numbers together. Uh, on the other hand, like the opposite of multiplication is another computational problem, factoring. So let's say you're given a number, then the instance is like a number and the task is to you know factor it. And uh, you know if I give you a 1,000 digit number and like put a gun to your head and say factor this number for me, then you may as well tell me to pull the trigger because there's no way you can like I mean, the first thing you think of it is just like try to divide it by all primes. But like if there's a thousand digits, you're trying like 10 to the 1,000 numbers potentially. And so that's, that's obviously not going to be efficient. And there's no algorithm that's like known that's too much faster than that. So that's an example of a problem. Actually, we don't know if there's an efficient algorithm for factoring, but it seems like not. Uh, I'll give you one more example just to make that clear. Like there's a problem called um, shortest paths. So that's the problem. And the input to the problem is a graph and two vertices. And the task is to find the shortest path in the graph between these two things. And this is actually another example of a problem that has an efficient algorithm. And you might think about it for a few minutes and see how it might do it. But if you've ever used like Google Maps, then maybe that might convince you that indeed you can solve this question efficiently. OK, so that's you know, computational complexity. And uh, you, know, you can character, character the task as uh, you know, for all the natural problems you might think of, try to decide if there's an efficient algorithm or not. So we're pretty good at this. I mean, for lots of nice problems, we know efficient algorithms. So like, that's one thing you can work on. And for lots of other you know, interesting problems, we know that they're NP-complete, which is, I don't know, it's a technical term you may or not know. Uh, but you, know, you can think of it as just meaning that there's no known efficient algorithm. Every uh, right-thinking person equates these two notions. Um, OK, so there's like hundreds of problems where we know that there's an efficient algorithm, and hundreds of problems that we like that we know that are NP-complete, which means you know, basically there's no efficient algorithm. Uh, but that's not everything. There's still like lots of interesting problems where we don't know. And for every like you know basic enough problem where we don't know if you can solve it efficiently, and we don't know if there's, you know, if it's NP-complete, that's like kind of an embarrassment to us. I mean, we should try to solve that. Uh, so uh, one example of a bunch of such problems is uh, maybe constraint optimization problems. I won't define what that is, but uh, it's an example of a class of natural problems that we care about where we don't know whether it's an efficient algorithm or whether you know, it's NP-complete. 
But one uh, great development of the last 10 years is uh, the following thing. If you assume this thing called the unique games conjecture, which I'll define it, uh, shortly, then uh, over the last decade we've shown that that would classify all of these unknown complexity constraint optimization problems. It happened to classify them all as, you know, of the NP complete type. Maybe that's a disappointment, but anyway, they would get classified. All these, you know, dozens of important problems if you assume this one unique games conjecture. So that was some nice work, but then you may ask, is this conjecture true or false, and uh, what's going on? Any, any questions so far? Okay, so, uh, right, so that'd be cool, it'd be cool to, you know, have this conjecture, but as I said before, it's like a 50-50 proposition, like half the people think it's false, so that's a problem. Uh, okay, so what is the unique games conjecture? I'll, I'll uh, tell you. The games thing in the name is like a misnomer, so just forget about that. Uh, so the conjecture is actually about the difficulty or easiness of one specific problem, okay? So I'll tell you the specific problem it's about. Um, so maybe you might call this the elevation problem. Okay, so the input to this problem is a directed graph plus on each edge there's an integer written. Okay, that's the input, a directed graph plus an integer on each edge, okay? And somehow um, the meaning of this, like, okay, suppose in the input you have an edge from u to v and uh, there's the integer r written on it. And somehow the meaning of that is that um, the elevation of v is r meters higher than the elevation of u, okay? So it's like you're kind of given like a topographical map, but you don't know the heights of each point, but you have this information about the relative heights of a bunch of pairs of points, okay? So that's the input. And uh, I haven't actually told you what the task is yet. And there's a few things you might uh, try or ask about. So the first thing you might ask about is maybe the most obvious question. I give you this, this directed graph plus the integers on the edges, and I ask you, uh, is this realizable? Like, can you assign a height to each point such that it's consistent with all these edge uh, differences in height? Okay. So um, does that sound easy or hard to you? as an algorithmic task. So if you have defined differently, what are you saying? Uh, you don't know the heights of the points. This is your task is to label the points with heights so that it's consistent with all the differences. Pardon me? So you wanted to define heights. Uh, it's just a question of finding the potential and going from there. You choose a point. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was? So if you choose one value, yeah, so uh, that's exactly right. Uh, this will easily decide whether or not um, these height differences are realizable. Like, just pick a point, any point, just call its height zero, it doesn't really matter. And then, you know, any edge that's coming out of that, that would sort of force the height of all these other guys. There may or may not be a contradiction now if there's, you know, some contradictory edge here. If there is a contradiction, then you just say, no, this is not a realizable graph. But if there's no such contradiction, then you keep propagating and if you eventually succeed, then you realized it, and if you eventually came to a contradiction, then it's, it's uh, not realizable. So that's an easy task. If you're given all these edge differences to decide if this is realizable with heights for the vertices. So that's not the unique games conjecture. Uh, here's another thing you could ask. Like, imagine somebody gives you one of these inputs, the graph and the, the labels on the edges, and uh, they tell you, hey, it's not possible to find heights that are consistent with all these edge differences. And that's not a lot of information. You can see that for yourself very easily, as we've said. But suppose they tell you, but actually, I promise you that it's possible to assign you know, heights to the vertices such that almost all of the edges are sort of correct. Okay? So all but maybe an epsilon fraction of the edges are consistent with the heights. Okay? They tell you that it's like a promise. And then your task is to you know, find this great solution that assigns heights and gets almost all the edges correct. Um, does that sound hard or easy? You can try propagating again, right? But if you get a contradiction, you know, you might say, well, maybe this is one of the bad edges that I should give up on. Or maybe you should, you know, fix things differently. Well, it turns out that that problem is uh, known to be NP-complete. So that problem has no efficient uh, algorithm. Uh, so that, that's too hard, that task, you know. Assuming that there's like an almost sort of perfect solution to find that almost perfect solution is very hard. So now let's make. Which yep. norm do you measure your epsilon? Uh, so you just count the number. 
So to measure sort of the quality of an attempted solution, you know, given its heights for all the vertices, you measure, you count all of the edges that are sort of correct. And um, you count all the edges that uh, just are wrong, and it's just the fraction that are wrong. Does that make sense? You mean correct rather than sort of correct. Sort of correct? Yeah. I don't know what I said. OK, anyway, if you understand, then that's cool. Uh, OK, so uh, here's, the real, here's the real problem. Uh, so you get this, this graph, and uh, it's not you know, completely sort of satisfiable with heights. But uh, you're promised that there is a solution, you know, heights for each vertex, such that all but an epsilon fraction of these uh, arcs are, you know, sort of uh, consistent with the solution. And uh, your task is to just find, you know, heights for each point, such that 50% of the arcs are consistent with your solution. Okay. You don't have to get this perfect solution, but just get one that's like kind of good. Uh, yeah, and the status of that problem is unknown, and uh, the conjecture that it's NP complete that there's no efficient algorithm for it is the unique games conjecture. Okay, so it's some elementary enough to state problem. It's not really clear why it's like so amazingly interesting. Um, you might ask about that 50% thing. You know, I said your target was to get 50% of the edges. That looks a little arbitrary. Um, but actually, there are known theorems. They're kind of hard theorems, but they're known theorems that uh, the problem is of equivalent difficulty if you make that 50%. 99% or 1%, just any sort of fixed constant between 0 and 1. Uh, OK, so that's the problem. We don't know its status. The unique games conjecture is the conjecture that it's, uh, there's no efficient algorithm. And as I said before, just assuming that this one problem is difficult, you resolve sort of the complexity of a whole bunch of other important algorithmic problems that you know, have nothing to do with like, graphs or elevations. I mean, lots of different things. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but you might say, well, all this like, nice work predicated, there's all this nice work predicated on this unique games conjecture, this assumption that this problem is hard. But um, you, know, you also told me, I also told you that 50% you know, of people think that it's false. So is that all, all that work like just useless junk if, if it turns out to be false, which maybe it will? Uh, well, it turns out that um, it turns out that there's something kind of special and like mysteriously awesome about the unique games conjecture, which is that uh, all this work, you know, based on it, has spawned a lot of unconditionally, you know, true results in mathematics that, um, you know, in lots of different areas that, um, you know, it's true regardless of whether or not the unique games conjecture is true or not. So somehow, this, studying this question has spawned a lot of interesting results, uh, unconnected to complexity. So. Um, yeah, I just wanted to tell you a few examples of those results, and then I'm done. Um, OK, so one result is uh, due to code in Vishnoi. It's about um, metric space embeddings. Um, they prove the following results. So suppose you have a metric space of negative type. So that's some technical term in metric space embeddings. It means an, a metric space where if you take the square root of the metric, the resulting metric is isometric to L2. That's a matric, metric of negative type. And uh, there's a very long standing conjecture that every such matrix is equivalent to an L1 metric up to constant distortion. So by Lipschitz equivalent. Um, yeah, so that was a long standing conjecture. And Code and Vishnoi disproved it. And it came out of you know, studying problems related to the unique games conjecture. So that's pretty cool. I mean, it doesn't seem so related. Um, so here's another example. This is a problem I worked on. Um, Here's the problem. Imagine you have to find a shape in d dimensions as volume 1. And it tiles space, but not in any old way. It has to tile space according to the integer lattice. So just all integer shifts has to tile space. OK. Um, the question is, how small can its surface area be? So if you have to tile space by like the integer lattice, you're like, well, I guess I could use a cube. That would work. And that has surface area in d dimensions as like a d, or 2 times d. Uh, on the other hand, any shape of volume 1 has surface area, uh, at least the surface area of the sphere, which is on the order of root d in d dimensions. So sort of the best tile, which works according to integer shifts, has surface area somewhere between square root d and d. And uh, we showed that actually there's a tile that works and has surface area constant times square root d. So it's kind of sphere-like, and yet it tiles space according to integer shifts. 
That's a nice like, problem in uh, geometry that, again, was, arose out of work on trying to prove the unique games conjecture. Uh, what's my third example? Oh yeah, there's this, uh, there's this inequality in functional analysis called the Grothendieck inequality. I guess Grothendieck invented it in like 1953 and his resume something, something, something. Maybe you know Eve? Not my field. Yeah, not my field either. But uh, it exists, and it's not too hard to state, but I won't state it. Basically, it says if you have some matrix of real numbers and sort of one norm of this matrix is bounded by a universal constant times some other norm of this matrix, more or less. Uh, so Grothendieck proved that, and uh, he left as you know, an open problem to you know, determine the best such constant that you could put there. He proved like 2.3 or something, and he asked what the best constant is. Um, that's the growth and deep constant, and so like a bunch of people worked on that, and this uh, person, Crivine, in 1977, gave a better upper bound that's like 2 over 2 ln 1 plus square root 2 or something. Uh, and Crivine also conjectured that this was the best, uh, best constant you could put there. And um, for a long time it seemed like that was true. And then, um, yeah, like one week ago, like Braverman, uh, Makarchev, Makarchev, and Asaf Naor, showed that that's false. They showed that actually you can have a slightly better constant than Kravine's constant. So they made the first progress on this in, I don't know, 34 years. And again, this was motivated by hardness of approximation and uh, the unique games conjecture. And uh, yeah, there's one more group of theorems that they are a bit hard to state, but they're concerned with um, mathematics of like social welfare and social choice, like election schemes, like, you know, Eros, the impossibility theorem, this area. So there's some theorem called um, Majority is stableist that somehow roughly says that if you're comparing like election schemes, the one that somehow, the election scheme that's sort of non-dictatorial, which is uh, most stable if there's sort of noise in the recording of the votes, is the majority scheme, which is a pleasant result for democracy. Maybe it seems intuitive, but it was, it was pretty hard to prove. But that again was also uh, motivated by uh, work on, on the unique games conjecture. So that's the mysterious aspect of the unique games conjecture. Even though nobody is really sure if it's true or false, somehow it nevertheless managed to, span, um, to uh, inspire a lot of interesting uh, results in mathematics and also theoretical computer science. OK, that's it. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs>